questions. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans chapter 8. Pastor Ross called just as we left Ohio uh, today. We've been out at my wife's family's uh, area uh, visiting with them, and uh, he asked me if I'd speak tonight, and I didn't mean to, but I hesitated on the phone. Uh, for one thing, I was looking forward to hearing him preach, uh, and I haven't had a chance to do that for a long time. And uh, for the other thing, I thought, when on earth am I going to study for a sermon for tonight? I'm driving all day long, and uh, I still haven't had time to study. You'll, you'll figure that out in just a moment. Uh, but there's a verse that's, that God's just been pouring into my soul uh, over these last weeks. And uh, from that verse, some, some other scriptures came to mind, and we're just going to kind of do a little walk through the Bible tonight. I'm not going to run around much. I'm just too tired for that, too old. Um, but I think there's something that, that God would have us to learn tonight. Uh, before we get into the scriptures, uh, let me just say on behalf of Trina, and I thank you for your love and your support and your prayers for us. The last 11 months uh, was a journey we didn't count on, and uh, it it's, uh, had its ups and its downs. And if the doctors are right, uh, we're, we're kind of coming to the last lap uh, of things. But uh, we know that God is good. And that has not changed. My wife in a testimony service a few months ago made this statement. She said, there is never a day that God is not good. And um, we believe that. We believe that with all of our hearts. And uh, you are in our hearts and minds. You always have been, you always will be, forever and ever. We don't know all of you, but we know many of you. Uh, we remember some of you getting saved. We remember some of you coming into the church. Um, and then over the years, as we come back every now and then, we see the new faces. And even tonight, there are people that I don't recognize. Uh, I'm glad to see my friends, the Jacobs. I've known them uh, probably longer than anybody in this room except my sister, uh, probably we're, we're in the 40-year mark, something now, and they've just been a constant blessing. They adopted me when I was a single youth pastor and uh, probably kept me out of trouble, and uh, I sure appreciate them uh, being here tonight. Romans chapter 8, I want to look at one of the most famous, well-known scriptures in the Bible. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 I would think if we wanted to, we could close our eyes and most of us would quote this verse word perfect. But I want us to look at it tonight. The Bible says, Romans 8, 28, and we know. We don't guess. We don't think. We don't even hope so. Hope is a wonderful word. But that's not what the Bible says. It says we know. We know without the slightest shadow of doubt. We know with absolute confidence we know that all things not just some things not just most things not just the good things but all things we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose I'm assuming tonight that I'm in a gathering of Bible believers if I were to ask tonight how many believe that this verse is true, I would assume most of us, if we're paying attention, uh, would raise our hands and say, yeah, I believe Romans 8.28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them are the called according to His purpose. Then I find a question that's always rising in my mind. If we say that we believe that, why is it that when something comes into our life that is not good, that we mirror the disciples that night on the stormy seas of Galilee, and they immediately, when the storm arose, went and, and shook Jesus away and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Don't you care about us? Don't you love us? Don't you see that we're going to die? And uh, we say we believe Romans 8, 28, and all of a sudden the storm arises, and we're saying, God, I thought you loved me. God, where did you go? God, don't you care what's going on in my life? And yet the Bible says we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them are the called according to his purpose. I'm going to be honest with you tonight. I have a question about Romans 8.28. I have a very serious and I believe a very valid question about this verse. And so if you'll just walk with me through the scriptures for a little bit, 
we're going to consider some things, and we need to, we need to find an answer to this question. I, I, think, it's, I think it's serious. I, I don't think I'm being a non-Bible believer, but I have a real big question about Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28 is one of the oldest themes in the Bible. It didn't just happen when Paul sat down and wrote uh, Romans chapter 8 and penned the 28th verse. It's not like all of a sudden this truth came into being. We find it in the very first book of the Bible. Turn, if you would please, to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. From... Genesis 37 to the end of the book, 23, 24 chapters of the Bible, the focus is almost entirely on a young man by the name of Joseph. We meet him at age 17. Up until he was 30 years of age, Joseph lived a nightmare life. I'm, I'm talking a nightmare life. He, he came from a dysfunctional family. His older half-brothers hated everything about him. The Bible says they could not speak peaceably unto him. Um, his father had four wives at the same time. That was legal in those days. Not smart, but it was legal in those days. And those wives didn't get along. He grew up in a terrible home, if you will. It should have been the most godly home on planet earth, but it wasn't. When he was 17 or 18 years of age, his brother sold him into slavery. In slavery, even when it looked like he was becoming top slave, he got accused of a crime that he did not commit and was thrown into prison, no trial. And there's no evidence in scripture or history that, that uh, Potiphar or Pharaoh had any intention of ever letting him out of prison. Everybody that he helped during those years forsook him and forgot him. He lived a horrible life, but at age 30, God turned it all around. He was brought out of prison. He was elevated to the number two position in Egypt. God gave him a wife. God gave him two little boys. And he named them. And when he named his first one, he said, For God hath made me to forget all of my father's house. God gave him the ability to just forget everything that his brothers and his dad and his moms did to him. He said, God made me forget. And he got, had another little boy and he named him and he said, because God's made me fruitful in a strange land. Once he forgot, he was able to bear fruit for God. Everything seemed well till his brothers showed up. You know the story with the famine. And all of a sudden he had to relive it all. He had to relive it all. All those emotions dredged up and we see him weeping a few times. And yet we see a man that, that stayed true and he stayed right. He could have destroyed his brothers and sought revenge. He had the power. And most of us would say he had the reasons to do so. But instead he saved them and their family and all of that. Um, after his father died, his brothers in the back of their mind kept thinking, Joseph's just wait until dad's gone. Then he's going to get revenge. Decades have passed. Joseph's in his 50s. And his brothers came to him after the death of their father and said, Look, our dad made us uh, a, a, a promise to tell you, please don't seek revenge on us. I don't think that happened. I think they're trying to cover their bases because they really thought they were doomed. And look at Genesis chapter 50, verse 19. Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Do you see Romans 8.28 in Joseph's speech? He said, you meant it for evil. Everything you did, you desired, desired to hurt me, and you thought I was gone for good, but even in spite of you, God meant it all for good. God allowed it because God knew I needed to come to Egypt. God knew a famine was coming. He knew that, that we could have food here, and He knew there'd be a place of safety, and our whole family's alive because... All things work together for good to them that love God, to them are the called according to His purpose. That's what he was saying. The oldest book of the Bible, the first book of the Bible, we see Romans 8.28. That just makes me have a big question mark though. Turn if you would to the book of Job. Book of Job, you know his story. Even unsaved people know the story of Job. Job chapter 23 has lost everything that was dear to him. His children, 
his health, his wealth, his servants. His friends have turned on him. He's got a bunch of friends. Every time I read what they did, I think with friends like that, who needs relatives? <laughs> Even the one person that should have given him support failed him. Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But Job somehow managed to hang on to his integrity. He said, shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord and not receive evil? The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But that man was suffering. And right in the middle of his suffering, notice what he says in verse number uh, 1. Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter, and my stroke is heavier than my groaning. He said, No matter how I try to put it into words, no matter what I say, my grief is heavier than my words. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, talking about the Lord, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. He said, if I could just find God, I'd ask him, what's going on? Why did you let this happen to me? Look down a little, verse number 8. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, and I cannot see him. I think as Job penned these words, he had to have been remembering those sweet days of fellowship with God. You know what it's like, where it's like God's right there in the room with you in a physical way. And he, where, when he talked to God, he knew God heard him. And he felt that touch in his heart. And, and he knew what it was to have a closeness with his God. He said, I can't find it. I look everywhere and I'm saying, God, where are you? As God walked through the garden saying, Adam, where art thou? He said, that's what I'm doing. Lord, where are you? I'm praying, but you don't hear me. I'm, I'm crying, but you're not answering me. God, I cannot find you. What a dark, desperate place to be. And yet from the, the ashes of such despair... Look at the majestic statement of faith he makes in verse 10. He said, I can't find him, but verse 10, but he knoweth the way that I take. He knows where I am. He knows the route I'm taking. He knows why I'm taking it. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Now, I want you to understand, when Joseph made his statement in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, his trials were over. The family was healed. He was wealthy. He was powerful. God had worked miracles. And he could see and understand all that God, God had planned. Job hasn't got a clue. Job is suffering and sorrowing. His friends are heaping scorn and ridicule. They were hateful in some of the things that they said to him. And he's crying out saying, I can't find God. I don't know where God is. But I do know this. All things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. So he said that, yeah. He said, God knows where I am. He knows the way that I take. And when He hath tried me, I'm going to come forth as gold. He knew that. That thought, that truth sustained him. Amen. Learn, turn, if you would, to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. The wisest man, human, outside of the Lord Jesus, who ever lived was Solomon. Solomon had his ups and downs. He had his good moments and he had some very bad ones. At the end of his life, he looked back and in the wisdom and under the inspiration of God's Spirit, he penned some marvelous words. Ecclesiastes 3, to everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Life has seasons. Just like the year has spring, summer, winter, and fall, life has seasons. And, Paul, uh, and, and Solomon says that. He says there's a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, that's called marriage, teenagers. And a time to refrain from embracing, that's called being a teenager. Time to get 
and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. To everything he said, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Solomon's looking at life. About a mile and a half from our church in, in, uh, on Route 5 in Wallingford, there is a Chinese buffet. It's called the Pacific Grill. I don't know if we've ever taken you guys there. Uh, it's one of the best in the area. Uh, and uh, when we have special speakers and, and things like that, we often take them there. They literally have everything on this buffet. Literally. Some of you are already hungry. You're ready, ready for the service to be over so you can go eat. We'll walk in there. And I can, I can always tell you exactly where my wife is going to go first. She goes to where they have the sushi. Dead fish that they don't cook. <laughs> and she'll load up on sushi. She'll get a, a pound or two of wasabi. Then she'll walk around the corner of that and they've got all kinds of seafood uh, there. None of it's cooked. They got these mussels in the shell with junk, junk you know, sprinkled all over it and, and all those kind of things. And uh, by the way, I, I don't eat raw fish. I, 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 be, I believe with all scriptural authority, God invented fires because he never intended us to eat raw fish. I, I believe there's a Bible foundation for that. But my wife will go there and she'll look at that part uh, of the, the Pacific Grill and she'll look at something, oh wow, look, that one still has the head on it and it has a couple tentacles still attached. Oh look, it's I just moved. Give me two of those. <laughs> man, man, I'm, I'm just walking past that. I'm the guy that goes to the Chinese buffet and I get the pizza. <laughs> and then Sam Womack, I do, I get the pizza. And we converge back to our table and I look at her plate and try not to gag. She looks at my plate and mocks me. But you know, it's okay. It doesn't matter. Because you see, it's a buffet. You pick what you want. You pick what you want. Some of us pick edible food and others dumpster dive. Don't you wish life was a buffet? Don't you wish that it's through life we could say, time of peace, time of war, I'm going to have the peace today. Yeah. Time to love, time to hate. Nah, I, I don't want anybody to hate me. I want the love part. Yes. Uh, I, I want the reaping part. Man, I don't like that mourning stuff. I, I want the happy dance. Amen. Don't you wish we could go through life and pick out all those nice things and leave the sushi parts behind? <laughs> but life's not a buffet. We don't get to pick and choose. Sometimes our Heavenly Father says, I'm going to put you through a season of peace. And then every now He says, you need a storm. There are some lessons you need to learn. There are some people you need to meet so you can minister to them. There are some things about me that I want to reveal, but it only happens in the middle of the storm. When Jesus calmed that storm and the seas were finally silent, His disciples said, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey Him? They had a newfound understanding and appreciation of who Jesus was that would have never happened had they not had that storm. So Solomon says, Life's not that buffet. You're going to take the time of war and the time of peace, time to love, time to hate. But notice what he says in verse number um, 11. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Our God is so amazing and so intelligent and so wise and so wonderful that whatever the season that we're going through, God takes that and blends it all together with the other seasons. And the Bible says He makes everything. You ought to underline that. That means nothing's left out. He takes the time of war and the time of peace, a time to love, time to hate, a time to be born, a time to die. And He makes it all beautiful in His time. You know what Solomon was saying? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Look with me one more scripture, Philippians chapter 1. Ross, I hope I'm doing all right on time. 
Philippians chapter number one. I said that because he looked a little drowsy. No. <laughs> Philippians chapter one. I don't know why he ever asked me to come back here. By the way, he says he loves me, but he keeps that picture out in the lobby. It's a tough, love. tough love. That's wrong love. <laughs> Philippians is what we call a prison epistle. When Paul wrote this, he was in the prison in Rome. He had all already suffered shipwrecks. He gives a list of the things that he endured for the cause of Christ. He is in, in prison. He's hoping to get out by 2 Timothy when he wrote the last of the prison epistles. He knew he wasn't getting out other than to go to heaven. For he said, the time of my departure is at hand. So Paul was suffering. He's in his final place. But he's writing to what I think is one of his two favorite churches, Philippi and Thessalonica. He writes to them this four chapters that is just filled with joy. If you were suffering the degradations of a Roman prison, would you write to somebody about joy? It was there in that prison and he told the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. This man had something from God that most of us never get. He writes to this church because they've heard about his sufferings. They love him. They were the only church that supported him with missionary giving them the whole way through. Others did now and then. Philippi is the only one that did it all the time. But notice what he says in verse 12. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. He said, I know you heard about the shipwreck. The words reached you. You, you know about the beatings. You know about my chains. Uh, you know about everything. You know that when I stood before Caesar, everybody abandoned me. Luke. Demas, all the rest of them, they abandoned me. He said, but I want you to understand, you're thinking it's all bad, but it's all fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. Some also of goodwill, the one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. He's in prison rejoicing. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, I know it looks bad, but I want you to understand something. I got to ask Nero, the emperor of the world, the most powerful man of the empire, I got to ask him if you died today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? And I got to ask him that because he wanted to know why I was here. So I told him, and he didn't know what the gospel was, so I just asked him the question. And then I thought, I got to share Jesus with Nero. Nero. The man who would ultimately put him to death, he said... But I got to preach to Nero. Do you realize you didn't just walk into the Roman uh, emperor's palace and just walk in and say, hey, I'm here to see the, the emperor. Uh, if you tried that in, in Nero's day, they would execute you thinking you had something bad uh, in, in mind. Uh, there were layers and layers of guards and protection around that man. He was, he was viewed by his people as a god. So he was protected to the utmost. But here's Paul standing there and he's standing in chains just telling this false God about the real God and how that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He said, look folks, do you realize how awesome this is? I got to preach to Nero. And everybody that was in his courtroom, they got to hear the gospel that day. And you know what I found out? There were some people standing. Some of them were servants. Some of them were guards. Some of them were senators. And I found out some of them had already gotten saved. I, I don't know how they heard the gospel. I don't know who told them. But I found out they were already saved, but they were terrified to say anything because Christianity wasn't very popular. But they saw me there preaching the gospel and Nero didn't have me executed right away and they just started getting a little bit of boldness to them. Saying, you know, Paul can preach and change. I can preach him too. So they started telling everybody around the palace about Jesus. Now some people didn't like it. 
And they're talking about Jesus in the wrong way. He said, but I don't really care because everybody here, they're not talking about Nero. They're not talking about the wars in Gaul. They're not talking about how we're doing in Palestine. They're talking about Jesus. You go figure that. Amen. You know what he was saying? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Amen. So he says in verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but all boldness is always so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Can you please mark this place so you can come back to it in a moment and go back with me to Romans chapter 8 where we began. I told you I have a question about this verse. And we know, we have no doubt, with absolute assurance that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them are the called according to his purpose. And I've been there where it didn't look so good. And I said, God, why did you let this happen to me? I don't think I've ever raised my fist and said, I'm going to curse God and die. But there have been times when I've wondered, Lord, I've been trying to do right and you let this happen? Remember Mary and Martha after Lazarus died and the first thing they said when they saw Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. You could have stopped this, but you didn't. You realize in that statement there was an accusation. You could have done something and you didn't and we're supposed to be the ones that you love. Why is it that that's what we ask when the Bible tells us from beginning to end? Different phraseology, different people in different circumstances at different times in history. We know that all things work together for good. Why? Because He's a good God. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for He is good. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. God is a good God. The goodness of the Lord endureth continually, the psalmist said. And yet when trouble comes, Lord, don't you care? We're asking the wrong question. Because see, the question about Romans 8.28 is, is it true? The question is not, does God really work everything together for good? Because He does. But we need to understand something. Not everybody can claim Romans 8.28. Not everybody, can, not everybody can claim it. Probably not everybody in this room can claim it. You say, but it's in the Bible and it says, and we know. But you've got to take the whole verse. You see, an unsaved person can't claim this verse. That's right. Amen. They can't. Because I don't care how many millions or billions they amass to themselves. I, I don't care how many jets they own. I don't care how many places in the world they can go to. I don't care how famous and how popular they become. When they breathe their last, they will lift up their eyes in hell being in torments. And that is the worst of all ends. Amen. See, an unsafe person can't claim this. I don't think a backslidden Christian can claim this. Someone that's living their life saying, I know what the Bible says, but it's my life and I'll do what I want. I'm not hurting anybody but me. By the way, those are all lies. Lies. It's not your life. If you got saved, it's His. And when we sin, we hurt everybody who loves us. Amen. Backslidden Christian can't claim Romans 8.28 because God puts down the conditions. Look at it. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. My question about Romans 8.28 is not the first half of the verse. Is God good? Does God take everything I'm going through and has he got something good in store? The question is, do I love him? I mean unconditionally. God said, Abraham, take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom Thou lovest unto one of the mountains of Moriah that I will tell thee of and offer him there a burnt offering. Abraham didn't flinch. Abraham didn't squabble with God. He marched his son up there with full confidence that, that he was going to obey God on that, but God was going to raise his son from the dead. Right. Of course, God stopped him. And he said, now I know that you fear God. There's nothing you love more than me. 
Jesus said, if any man hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his brethren and on and on, he cannot be my disciple. He's not telling us to be hateful people. He's just saying there ought to be nobody that we love more than him so that if the choice ever comes, my brethren or my God, God always wins. Right. Right. Amen. The question is not, is God good? The question is not, is God taking this trial going to work it together for good? The question is, do I love him? Right. Selflessly, sacrificially. Do I love him enough to yield to his purpose? The called according to his purpose. See, I know what I want. I know what I want. God knows what I want. But if God doesn't give me what I want, will I still love him? That's the question. The question is, am, am I that yielded? I think of Ezekiel a lot these days. Yes. Yes. Ezekiel did a lot for God. He suffered a lot for God. Yes. One day God said, I'm going to take away the apple of your eye. But I want you to mourn. I want you to grieve publicly. I want you to go out and preach my word. And the Bible says, Ezekiel penned the words, in the evening my wife died. And in the morning I arose and did as I was commanded. Do I love God that much? I'm a yielded to His purpose. Go back if you would to Philippians and we'll be done. Thank you for your attention tonight. Paul's talking to this church about all that God did. What looks so bad has just been a tremendous opportunity to see people saved and to witness to Nero it's amazing God even loves the vilest sinners and he wants them to at least have the opportunity to hear Jesus. Yes. But can I tell you why Paul could look at prison and chains and rejoice? Because he said it twice. <laughs> I there and do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Here's why. Paul shares his heart in verse 20. He said, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, he said, here's the desire of my heart that I get out of prison. Here's the desire of my heart, that all of my enemies are put to shame. Here's the desire of my heart, that I get to be back in Philippi with all the people that I love. He didn't write that. He said, here's the desire of my heart, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness is always so, now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. He said, Here's my one desire, that no matter what happens, Christ will be magnified. Amen. No matter what happens, my Father will be pleased. No matter what happens. Paul was saying, and he wasn't being boastful, wasn't being arrogant, he wasn't being self-righteous. He was just saying, I not only believe the first part of Romans 8.28... I believe the last part. And I've decided I love God more than anything. Amen. And I'm going to let Him work His purpose, whether it's life or death. Whatever glorifies Him most. For to me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. So the question tonight is, do I love God? Do I love Him enough to yield to whatever His purpose might be? Trusting Him that all things work together for good. I can't answer that question for you, and you can't answer it for me, but listen very carefully. Every one of us has to answer it. Amen. Every one of us. And we know, what a great promise, we know, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. So the question is not, is God good? The question is, do I love Him? The question is, do I love Him enough to just yield this purpose. The desire of my heart. Is it the answer to that? Yes. You may struggle with that some. I don't always want what God wants. I didn't want to leave this church. I didn't want to. But I had to come to the place, God, what do you want? 
And he had a different place for me, and he had a different man for you. Amen. But we struggled. Maybe, maybe you need to come and say, Lord, I'm struggling with this one. Could you help me? He'll answer that prayer. Amen. He loves an honest heart. You may not even have an issue, but you will. You might be in the time of peace, but there's a time of war coming your way. You need to get this settled now. When it does, who wins? You or God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the testimony found throughout the Bible that for that child of God that's yielded, you have a plan that is so remarkable that I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And Lord, we thank you for that truth, that you're a good God. Lord, we're asking you tonight for help, that our love for you, our yieldedness to you, would be what it ought to be, so that we can see those promises fulfilled. Lord, be patient with us where we struggle, Give wisdom, give grace, and strengthen us through the trial. Lord, I, I, I don't assume for a moment that Trina and I are the only ones in this room going through a bit of a trial. I'm sure that we're in good company. So, Lord, we need your help. May we take the thoughts tonight, and instead of saying, Master, carest thou not? Instead of saying, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother wouldn't have perished. Or instead of saying with Job's wife, what's the point? Curse God and die. May we yield like Paul and say, I rejoice. Therein I will rejoice. Lord, I pray you'll just bless this truth. It wasn't a great sermon, I know that, but it's a great truth. I need your help with it. I need your help with it. May we just be a loving, yielded people.